Well, my name's David Chapman, and we're with John Nyland, the former great Dallas Cowboy John Nyland. He played guard for the Dallas Cowboys number 76. He was drafted in the first round, fifth overall in 1966, his rookie year. He's 6'3", weighs 245 pounds, full of muscle. Full of muscle. <laughs> He played for the Cowboys for about 10 years and the Eagles for a couple of years. But he, he played, uh, when he first came up to the Cowboys, he played next to Tony Lisco, Ralph Neely, some names, uh, block, he blocked for running backs, Don, Dan Reeves, Don Perkins, Craig uh, Bayham, Walt Garrison, Calvin Hill, Dwayne Thomas, Robert Newhouse, Preston Pearson. You got a good number. A lot of That's pretty good. A lot of good running backs that you two played against, some of you two for. Then he had uh, quarterbacks. He had Don Meredith, Craig Morton. And Roger Sawback, which you had actually two different style of quarterbacks that you had a block for. Yeah, very much so. And then you practiced against defensive linemen, Bob Lilly, Hall of Famer, uh, George Andre, Jethro Pugh, Pat Toomey, Harvey Martin, Larry Cole. Those were some big names back in that time with the Cowboys. And then you had Chuck Halley, linebackers, Leroy Jordan, Dave Edwards, D.D. Lewis, all house. How do you names. remember all those? I was a football fan. I followed you, John. I was a fan of yours when I was young. I'm impressed. Okay, then uh, let's let's talk let's talk about a few of those players. Let's talk about Tony uh, Lasicio. It's Lasicio. Lasicio. Yeah. He uh, he was actually the first player that that helped you when you when you come on the line. You no, know, started with the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. He spent a lot of time with you. Didn't well, you? he played guard there for a short period of time before I got here, and they moved him over to tackle. I think the year before I got here. Uh, so he knew how to play the game. He knew how to play the game from different positions. He thought it was very good, and Tony was very. Patient with me, I guess you'd say. You know, he's a dumb rookie, and he's number one draft choice, and he's playing next to me. I mean, I don't want him to screw up. But point being is, that we were very helpful to each other. And they, those guys you mentioned, uh, even if you made mistakes in practice and bring it to your attention, that's what that's what camaraderie is all about. Right. And uh, that's what I think is important for having a, a successful team. Right. And you, what about uh, Bob Lilly? You know, played against. Yeah, well, Bob, I played against every day in practice. I mean, you know, when you lay out, line up against the best. Defensive, arguably the best defensive tackle in the game at that point. Uh, you know, I learned an awful lot. Number one, I couldn't hit him. <laughs> I mean, he was that fast. You know, right. he, but you know, he taught me so much to uh, prepare myself for a fast defensive lineman. Right. And for that reason, he showed me techniques and things I did beyond my physical capabilities. You got to play smart when you were with Landry. I mean, right. we had a very, very difficult offense. Uh, we were given aptitude tests. I'm answering a long question. I hope that's not the... No, keep going. You know, aptitude tests were important back then. We were given a test on Friday night or Saturday morning. And uh, we had to pass the test. If we didn't pass, we didn't get to start. You want to affect a professional athlete? Don't let him start. <laughs> right. Not cut right. him. Not, not sit him on the bed. Just don't let him start. And he, he, you'll get his attention. And for that reason, you know, we didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, I think Lily took a lot of time trying to develop my talent. You don't draft a guy number one and have him not make it. You know, right. you want the guy to make it. Right. And so for his reasoning, uh, I was very grateful because he was the best at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say he was probably the all-time best that I ever played against. I, I didn't like blocking him every day. But he taught me a lot, and he prepared me for being John Nylon, the, the professional athlete. Right. And he was strong, too. I mean, he was fast, but he was strong as well. Well, he was agile strong. He, right. he could move laterally as quickly as he moved uh, horizontally. I should say, he moved laterally as far as uh, you know, going up and down the field. But he was not a bum rusher. He wasn't the kind of guy that's going to bowl you over. Not right, a, right. He'd go up, grab you, throw you around, go for the quarterback. Sure. And I'm sure it goes the other way, too. The better you got by playing against Bob Lilly, the better Bob Lilly got. Because as soon as he taught you how to do these smaller things and the, and the bigger things, what to look for, what not to look for, mm -hmm. and you got you start picking this up and you started getting you more comfortable with it and started getting more knowledgeable about what Bob Lilly does, mm -hmm. the better you got. I'm sure you made Bob Lilly better because now, okay, well, he's got this down pretty well. Now i got to do something different. i got to, no, I got to try and approach this a little bit harder and show him something new. Right. You know, so it, it kind of goes back and forth. Bob Lilly helped you a great deal, but I'm sure Bob Lilly would probably agree that you helped him a great deal too. Well, I think he was, he was mm -hmm. thankful that I was a fast lineman. In other words, I wasn't slow. I wasn't sloppy. I wasn't going to bang him up on the, in the, on right. the contact. Uh, I was just going to try to block him and control him. Mm -hmm. and that was hard enough. You know, I couldn't get him off the line necessarily, but right. I could block him. And he, he would move with me. And there's a lot of things you could talk about as far as getting uh, an upper hand on the on the defensive uh, player. But in my case, he was the best. And if I could block him, and I had to consciously be ready to block him every play that we went against each other, because mm -hmm. we didn't. Back then we had a thing called full potatoes. Right. Now full potatoes <laughs> means you're going live. Right. No questions asked. 
Well, Bob always wanted to go full potatoes. <laughs> Landry didn't like that, you know. But he was he was doing his job, you know. And, and Landry let him get it done, and he let me uh, go against full potatoes with him too, you know. And that was kind of it wasn't so much we were at war with each other. We just wanted to teach each other what we were preparing for that week. Right, right. And you had to because in the game situation, you you don't practice one game. I mean, in practice, you're not going to play one game. So you got to be 100 percent. That's right. Kind of right. Practice. And that's what Tom Landry. Uh, it's, no, he wanted that. He wanted that. He wanted hard practices as well as, as you know, hard, hard games. So you guys get you prepared. And there's no do-overs. Right? <laughs> In football, there's no do-overs. Okay, but time out. Let me do that one again. Um, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And I think that's the excitement of the game, quite frankly. Right. Right. Let's, let's talk about Leroy Jordan. He was uh, the captain of the defense. Yes, he was. And, uh, oh, he was a cap no, he was co-captain of the team. Co-captain of the team. Yeah, I think. Uh, but he was captain of defense, yes. Right. And I think Roger was the captain of the uh, team. I mean, they switched out captains from certain games, but uh, overall, you know, Leroy was pretty much the leader, uh, spiritual leader uh, from the standpoint of, uh, um, you know, we knew that he knew that he knew. <laughs> right, right. So don't try to screw around. Just we knew he knew you. <laughs> Just run the play the way it's supposed to. So, so what, um, as far as the defense is a, a part, you know, going against them, you got blitzes from coming from linebackers, mm -hmm. you know, left, right, middle, a lot. You as a player, you know, what you had to worry about the defensive ends, the defensive tackles coming through there. But how would you watch the, the, the linebackers as well? I mean, mm -hmm. say, you know, when they start to go around or what have you, swift players, how would you pick up a linebacker? Well, this peripheral vision, I think, is important if you can see with the entire field. When you go up to the line, if you're just focused straight ahead, you're going to lose. You want to be able to see the vision of everything. And I think that's really what makes a good offensive lineman is he can fire out, try to hit his tackle, tackle's making a slant in, and so for that reason you got to come up and get the linebacker. Well, right. you got to be in position, got to be in balance to do all that, and you just can't be arbitrarily close your eyes. The main thing is, keep your eyes open. Right. So let me stress that one more time. Keep your eyes open. If I go like that, you're going to blink. Uh, you maybe didn't. Be. Right. <laughs> you're used to this. Have you done this before? <laughs> um, but most people will blink, you know what I mean? And the right. same thing when you take, even if you got a football helmet on, with a mask protecting you, if you put your hands in that man's mask, he's going to feel something, either emotionally, physically, or he's going to be uh, uh, quite surprised. Right, because you can right. typically get a good guy, I don't care how good he is, if you get into his face, get him to blink, that split second, you can get around him, or you can tackle him, or you can push him out of the way. you, you got to just prepare your game well. Right, right. you okay, got to be aware of what's, what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, right. you got to see what's going on. You just can't look at the guy in front of you. You look at the guy in front of you, yeah, look at his eyes. Concentrate on his eyes. You can certainly see same things in his eyes, but you have to be aware of everything going around around him too. Right. And that took not just his talent. It, it took. Uh, uh, you had to persevere. You had to be uh, uh, conscious of it every play. Right. No matter what kind of block you're making, make sure you understand the periphery of what's happening because. You'll be graded on it next Saturday. It's a fast game. You didn't, yeah, if you don't pass, you don't play. Um, <laughs> by the way, he wouldn't let you uh, start, but he would put you in because he's not stupid. He go, <laughs> he's gonna punish you, make you think about what you're doing. Exactly, playing. exactly. Uh, and you know, so in my case, you know, all these great ball players I played against, the Leroy Jordans, the D.D. Lewis's, the uh, uh, Chuck Howley, you know, I, I'm I'm very grateful I had a chance to play against the best because they were the best. Maybe right. they weren't the biggest, but that's only the strongest. Right. They're smart. They're smart, right? And I've heard about Leroy Jordan. He was, he was a, a, a student of the game. Uh, yes, he was. When he played. And when I, 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 I know it's about you, too, when I watch football. When I watch you on TV, you know, it's that you always kept Did your you legs moving. Back then? We had black and white. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, true. We had black yeah. and white. <laughs> but you, you always kept your, your feet moving, your hands are up, and you're always... Yeah. Your, head, your head will always, always weave on passing plays yeah. and other plays. I always think you, your feet never stop moving. The only time they stop moving is when you made contact, but then the move kept moving yeah. again where you had to push your guy out of the way. Right. Well, that doesn't happen very often. It's very, very seldom in the NFL is one guy going to push another guy totally out of the way. Right. It's not going to happen. I mean, you might get lucky at one play and you know, get the right balance situation. But generally speaking, these guys are in the NFL. They didn't get there by just being pansies, you know. They right. got there because they're pretty darn good. Right. If you played against a guy in the NFL, you just get you know just buckle up because you got to be prepared. And for my position, position, it wasn't so much I was in trickery. We weren't tricking the ball players, but we were just real confident. You know, we knew that we could double block them and come off and you know get the linebacker right. if there's an option, uh, or we knew we could get the center uh, uh, linebacker. But the point being is that we all played well together. We had to practice our plays over. 
and over and over and over and over and <laughs> over. It's so the same play. It's, the same. it's over. And over. <laughs> we'll keep playing this uh, practice and this play until everybody gets it right. So, right. you know, it didn't make any difference. We had a bunch of plays, very, very uh, challenging. Landry was very smart. Uh, but it really boiled down to you against that person in front of you. Right. And right. if that person not there, you better hit the next person. You better get the next person. Yeah. If you miss him, get away. Anyway, you can do it. going down, right. Got it. You don't want to stand around. And you were noticed as one of the best pulling guards in, in the NFL in, in the 60s and 70s, your era. You were, you, I mean, you, that's something that, that you took pride on. Yeah. And something that you, were, that you were good on. Because when you pulled and, and, and blocked somebody, you didn't just block somebody, you went through the, that, that player. Yeah. You got him down. Well, I watched, it, it, you know, when I started as a rookie, who, who did we watch back then? Well, the Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. And sweeps, you know, Landry was very much a, a, wasn't a copyist, he wasn't copying. He designed his own end sweep, but he believed in the end sweep. Right. So we taught how to pull, how to pull the lead box, how to read the defense coming around the offensive uh, end there. And consequently, you know, we were pretty darn good at it. But right. we were good at it because you couldn't tell if we were pulling or not when you're in the offensive line. If you, if you gave it away, a lot of guys give it away, you know, right. they sit back on their haunches. Well, we couldn't do that. We, we had to really just get in there and pretend like we're going to just block straight ahead at the same time. Goodbye. <laughs> You're gone. Yeah. That takes a little bit of creativity, ingenuity. I think that the land was pretty smart about how he did it. We believed in the end sweep. We, we called it every game. We used it every game. Uh, and it, this was one of the better plays in our arsenal of offensive plays. That's something you had to learn balance. For not yeah, yeah. Balance and skates. Balance with, with spikes on or skates on or, or, or whatever. That's a that's a given option. Talented, yes, uh, but you're challenged. Uh, I didn't know how to skate. I never skated in my life. Mm -hmm. But I got on those, uh, you know, we had real long spikes back then. I think they were like a half inch or whatever. Uh, I didn't particularly like them. I like the one inch spikes. Right. You know, I, you have you a little more grip. Yeah, you want right. a better grip. You want better grip on the ground. But that was illegal back then, so we had to go with the spikes that we were given. And that gave us... Freedom, but at the same time, it was a little bit awkward because that was different in college. Right. And I learned to play on AstroTurf. <laughs> in college, you didn't learn to play that. That yeah. just started coming in the industry. And then Landry, of course, when they get, when the stadium got knocked down, they built their brand new stadium and uh, put AstroTurf in. And they right. thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Visually beautiful. Right. Well, it became a whole new ball game when you played on AstroTurf. That's harder. That's harder when you land on the ground, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, it was, it was tough on your body because... First of all, stuff would get into your skin if you scrape your elbow. Right. We'd have to pull out the pieces of uh, astroturf. Right, right. I call that astroturf back then. I don't know what they call it. But the point is that, you know, all of that stuff kind of, well, it was there to protect us because it was softer. Right. It wasn't soft. It was like hitting our concrete rock. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was only like that thick. Right. You did it. You did it because that's, but that changed the game a lot, too. And that also opened up a lot of the game up the middle. Right. Because you could take wider stances. You weren't afraid of guys running around you because the guy could run around the other way if he's paying attention. Right. And so you just wanted to make contact with the guy. You know, it, you obviously have a, a, an option to play. The players that we had were good about reading the blocks and setting the blocks up for you. You know, Dan Reeves set the block up for me. I, I was very, very, very grateful. You can't block a Merlin Olsen and a, and a Joe Green and a, and, a, and a Rosie Greer with just a little tap block. You know, you've got right. to be able to outsmart them. They were much bigger than me, much smarter than me as far as the game went. And I just had to just go in there and put my head down in their gut and try to block them out. I was good at that. I was good at a good pile driving block. And if that was the case, then that's what really got me on the team. Right. I could knock the guy back. Rarely did they make the tackle on their own. And, you know, of course. And stayed with it and took him out of the play. Yeah, exactly. I, we, we were just pretty darn good. I had Rayfield next to me. I had Tony Lissio, right. Tony Lissio next to me. I had... Yeah, you know, I had so many great players around me. How could you not win? Right. You know, that, that was really what it balled out. And you guys helped each other out too on yeah. blocks and stuff. And we knew we were going to play well. You know, we just knew we were going to play well. Now it doesn't mean we beat everybody badly, but right. we knew we had the success of uh, five guys up front that really cared, right. and we played for a long time together. You guys played play well together. And, we, and for a long time too, right. the same team. Exactly. Same and that's line. that's important. That's important, Walt Garrison. And we asked Walt Garrison about about, about his linemen. You know, I said. Uh, how how did you know when, when 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 you were running the ball that your lineman I mean when 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 were you gonna cut and when were you not gonna cut what's the way that you you should go and should not go mm -hmm. and Walker just confined he just came out and said he goes well, it's a lineman he goes our linemen are supposed to be at a certain place at a certain time yeah 
And when, when we run, you know, like the first, second half, we're running through through the line. Uh, Donald's got, got this guy blocked here. Uh, the center got this guy parked, blocked here. He goes, and he goes, it's timing. Timing is yeah. everything. And you knew that. the hell's only going to be there, split second? Exactly. Yeah, the confidence that you had there. He goes, I, not, nobody said, all you need was a split second to get through that. That's and then, then go through the line. And he goes, well, I said, well, I, let me ask you about this. Pulling plays. I said, plays that, that you come around the end. I said, and you got John pulling, and he's going in front of you. He makes that one block, you know, he goes, and, and, uh, and you go forward. He goes, let me tell you about John. He goes, John would make that block here, and I'd go around here, and I would be fixing to get tackled. I'd have to stop and come back around. He goes, John would be there and hit this guy, and then make me come back around this guy. Yeah. I said, well, how do you know that was going to happen? He goes, it's practice. Well, you guys yeah, yeah, practice, yeah, practice right. and you just have confidence in your in, in your lineman. Yeah. He goes, but uh, he goes a lot of those runs I, I made, the long runs. He goes, we're uh, we're just an offensive lineman not quitting. Not that's that's quitting. a good point. You know, we were always told to make the block. Of course, you stay with the block. You stay with it. You stay with it. But at a point, you come off that block, and it comes off. You want to come off and do a second block. You know, and mm -hmm. like you say, you open up the field, and if you could just spread out the defense. So we weren't just blocking one person. We were uh, blocking at a point of attack. Uh, that was our assignment. But you had a second reaction of um, uh, just an instinct of coming off that block and going after maybe a safety. Right. You know, because safety's going to come up and try to make that attack right, as well. Right, right. So we were trying to talk. We were taught to basically keep our eyes open. Again, keep your eyes open. Because when you make a block and you've got your head in his chest, mm -hmm. you're probably going to close your eyes. You know? Right. But right. you learn to keep them open. Because now you can see around him, and you can go up there, as, I, as you mentioned, and, and just uh, try to make a second block for your right. running back. I mean, yeah, I and mean, if you see your running back go this direction, whatever, yeah. you've got... Most ball players want to hit, and that's it. No, right. but one shot. Uh, in fact, they used to have that... Uh, nick they gave me a nickname one game, uh, Johnny, one uh, Johnny One Shot. Because I went out and I blast... I was a rookie. Right. I blasted off, completely missed the guy. <laughs> he just swiped inside me, and here I'm standing there, and the play's going on, and right. I didn't do a damn thing. Right. Landry made it very clear in practice, uh, uh, Johnny, uh, we, we, we do more than one shot here, <laughs> or something like that. You know, one of my teammates came right, up with it. Right. So for that season, I was Johnny one shot. Believe me, for the rest of the season, I was out there running my butt off trying to hit anybody with an offensive jersey. <laughs> uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, okay, well, so let, let's, let's talk about Meredith, Morton, and Salvac. Two different, actually, Meredith and Morton were, were pocket passers. They didn't run around much, you know. They they go back to read the defenses and, and, and throw the ball. Start and, and a lot of times when they get in trouble, they were they were either really being risk risky being sacked because they wouldn't move much. Up to you know up in, in the middle, they will try and release a pass. I'm not saying they're bad quarterbacks. I'm just saying there's a lot going around you. It's a fast game. Sure. And then you have Stallback, which has had more mobile legs than you did those two. Mm -hmm. You know. So and, and Stallback had had a habit of, of moving out of the pocket. Yeah. And, and you guys would have to adjust to that moving out of the pocket with Stallback. You want to make it pass. Well, actually, Roger really gave us more of a relief in our personal uh, exhaustion point, if you want to say it that way. Right. Because when you play every play, every play, every play, we never get a break. Right. I mean, we're either getting hit or hitting somebody every single play. Right. It's not like a running back who goes out there maybe and fakes and you know, doesn't get touched. Or an end goes running down the field never gets the ball. Right. You know, th that's, that's energetic. But what I'm getting at is when you put physicality with, with, with the explosion of your body going into another person, you've given up a lot of energy. Right. And, and when you do that 60, 70 times a game, that's not easy. You get tired. That's not easy. Yeah. So the one thing Landry stressed with us primarily was endurance. Right. You know, we would finish practice, and then we'd have to run 10 wind sprints. Wind sprints, you know what they are. They're terrible. Right, right. But these right. were 100-yard wind sprints, <laughs> and you had to do it before the clock went out. Right, right. Well, here we are running wind sprints after a tough practice, and usually it was twice a week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday practices. We'd go in there, and we'd come off. We couldn't run off the field. We had to walk off the field, but you had to get off the field. I mean, right. you had to... Right, so he, he did. He tried to do his best to build up your endurance. Exactly yeah. right, and that's all. And that also helped us. We had no fat linemen. Right. We had no fat linemen. I mean, respectfully. I mean, most linemen you see today are three hundred and twenty-five pounds. I mean, that's ridiculous. But that's what it is today. Right. Back then, you couldn't weigh over two sixty-five. Glad we wouldn't let us weigh over two sixty-five. If you were overweight, it was a hundred dollars a pound per day. Wow. Doubled the next time you got weighed in, which was a week later. They weighed in, and then like every Friday. So yeah, we're fit. And if we were overweight, I mean, they literally lined us up. 
By the way, you're doing pretty good with it. Good comment. You're doing awesome. <laughs> now you carry me real well. I appreciate that. I make the job easy for you. You make the job easy for me. <laughs> yeah. So, so we were talking about wind sprints. You, you know, you ran 100 yard wind sprint. Yeah. So, Tom Landry was building up your guys' endurance for long games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that, so in, I mean, and you, and you, uh, you obviously did a good job because you guys really didn't show no tiredness when you were on the field. Sure. But I know you guys got out, out of breath. And the more running games, or more running plays you ran, I mean, that's more energy that you were putting forth. Sure. The passing game, you kind of gave you a little bit more of a, of, of a breath, but you're still having to block and come back and block your man. But uh, this is okay, so now let's talk about Roger. When, uh, when Roger would, would go out, you were talking about it would kind of be a little more relief when Roger would go out and, uh, and uh, scramble to throw, a, to throw a pass. Well, he, he, Roger made it easier to play uh, offensive tackle and guard because we obviously knew that, yeah, we could block and put a, you know, give Roger time to throw the ball. But Roger was so smart and so good athletically. He could stand in that pocket, look around, look around, had a good peripheral vision. If the pass wasn't there, he'd run. Right. And usually he'd run away from, you know, the majority of where it was. <laughs> and so you end up, uh, you know, sometimes you're out there leading around and sweep like you're the lead of the runner. Right. And, and Roger behind you, and you don't want to screw up. So you had to, it was a great way of saying, Roger, you're not going to get trapped. We know that. Right. But give us a shot. Make sure you get this lined up so we can get in front of you before you start running right, out there. Right, right. Where he has protection. Uh, exactly. Buy, right, buy yeah. more time on that play. Yeah, I, I, in my case, for example, I was very strong in my body and the structure of my body, but I wasn't that great ver visually. Uh, you know, I could say, yeah, I could see guys walking around, but I wanted to get good at everything I did. But the biggest thing for me was trying to stay in front of the guy in front of me. Right. Either you had to block him and stay in front of him, or pass protect him and stay in front of him. And for that reason, this became this became a much more a professional sport. Let's right. put it that way. It's right. not a game anymore. Right. It's your professional sport. You like to call it a game, but it's listen. It's your livelihood, and it's technique as well, but it's strength as well. Absolutely, it's your strength against his strength, and then technique comes in behind that. But that's where you gotta, you guys gotta play against, mm -hmm. against each other. And that's where where you got good at because you got to read where you no know, kind of where they pushing you here or pushing you here or the arms and when they bring the arms up and around or what have you. You know, you 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 you've learned that on players that that you that you played against. Yeah, and you and you watch them in films, and if they learn any new te any new techniques, you try to get your defense tackled. When you're running offense, the defensive tackle in this case was Lily. Lily could interpret a lot of those players for me, right? And 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 actually block, made me block and make me more conscious of my block because he would interpret what that defensive guy was going to do against me. Right, which is perfect because you you played against uh, defense like fearsome foursome. Uh, I you played, played against, against uh, purple, purple purple people leaders. I mean, <laughs> no, you don't have you don't have these these names anymore nowadays. My yeah, first game, days. my first game, I remember it. My first game I got into play was a rookie. Somebody got hurt, so I got in there against the L.A. Rams. And here is L.A. Ram, Roger Brown. I'm sorry, a Detroit Lion, Roger Brown was the next week. This week, L.A. Ram was uh, Rosie Greer. Right. And he just beat the poop out of me. I mean, he was so big. He's 350 pounds back then, which was back then a lot of weight. And here I am at two, whatever I was, 245. 245. And this guy just came in and bowled me over, you know, and I thought, no, I can't let that happen again. This is something i got to really get, uh, you know. So I became smarter about my own blocking right. technique. By you losing and by you making mistakes, you get better. Right. Or you get worse. There's no in-between. You, you, you're trying to figure out what works on this guy, what doesn't right. work. So eventually you find that out, find his weaknesses. And Landry and had a great way of it. He did a great job of preparing us. Right. You know, they had a tremendous uh, scouting system up there that, Every play was graded, everything that was done. Was, at the end of the films, they would get a report once a week uh, from all the games they watched about our opponents. Mm -hmm. And it would set up the game plan, and it was pretty pretty stable based on all the information we could get from the last three or four games. So did you watch film against your players? Like, do you have oh, yeah. The, that steel curtain? I, I would bring film home. I'd sit in my room like this, and I'd watch film. And, I'd sit there for hours watching the film because I wanted to make sure I understood what was happening and certainly wanted to prepare for the game I was going in. And players, you know, it wasn't so much we were playing Detroit or we were playing L.A. Rams. I mean, they're all good. But I had to play Roger Brown the next week. Right. Roger Greer the first week. Beat the poop out of me. I played Roger Brown the next week. Ran all over me. And he would, these guys were like 350 pounds. Right. And, I was, and we legally couldn't weigh over 265. Landry said 265 was the maximum that a guy six foot three, I guess, uh, could perform on this team, you know, and, right. and all have the endurance to running uh, offensive plays, especially if you're a guard where you're going to pull a third of the time, most right. likely, on running plays. So, you know, we, we, we were, 
And when I went against Rosie Greer and Roger Brown, I came off that field, and Landry kind of colored me over, and he said, don't worry about that, just, just, just stay, hang in there. <laughs> and, you know, that, that gave me better yeah. confidence, because here I was, I played two lousy games. Right. I got stuck in there because a guy got hurt, rookie. Right. And I had played with a veteran team, with a great quarterback and Don Meredith, and obviously we, you know, we wanted to win. We were winning back then. We started winning back then. Right. We became believers. And that whole 65, 65, 66 draft group that came through, uh, even though there some great veterans on the team, you know, we took over some positions right. and made this team better. And I think that that was the one good thing about Landry. He knew how to draft. He knew how to train. He knew how to put a game plan together. And he knew the players. Right. He knew what he had. Right. And the thing about it, you, you started, I guess after your, your fourth game, you, you, uh, you became a starter from the line. Well, because yeah, it was an injury. An injury got hurt. Leo right. Donahue got hurt, and they had put somebody in there, and that was me. And then they got some other guy that played. It was and we had to switch around. Right. And and you know, I guess they saw enough talent in me saying, "Hey, he's going to make it." You know, right. we're going to play with him. So I started, uh, as I said, about half that year, and then uh, the next year I started full time. Right, but you were learning as you were playing. Oh yeah, it was like you were kind of thrown into the fire. You know, yeah, so yeah, you, you, you're thrown into the fire. You're a rookie. You don't know anything. You don't know the pros. You don't know the. Uh, the system, you're learning the system along with learning how to play against the pros. Right. Uh, and so it's a rude awakening. Right. And so, just learning. Just learning it, yeah, I understand. And, and let's let's talk about, you know, you, you play against the, the Steel Curtain, Elsie Greenwood, Joe Green, you know, and, and a lot of these people that we've mentioned, you guys play twice a year. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, I mean, that's those are, that's a lot of Hall of Famers, a lot of Ring of Honor people in there you know, that you played against. So, I mean, you didn't have just the really just average teams that you played against. You played against some pretty qualified teams, some good teams. Yeah, and at the end of the year, we would actually grade the teams we played against. You know, they would ask us at the end of the year, who's, who would you want in the Pro Bowl against you? In other words, you wanted to, pray, you wanted to vote for the most important, impressive person right. to play against you. Right. Well, typically, they would, you know, they would line us up and say, you know, this. and when I made the Pro Bowl, I was elated because I thought, wow, they respect me. They voted me in. Back then, right. the players voted them in. Right. And the coaches voted too, but I think the players had more influence. And so when I started making the Pro Bowl in, that, I think, my third year, I thought, well, I'm starting to get some respect. That even motivated me more. I mean, I was just, I, I'm, I'm with the, the function of, of understanding I'm as good as, if, right. if not better. Uh, and, uh, but you don't stay there. You got to work at it. Right, I mean, you don't, right. You don't. You don't just. Your live. confidence level went up from here to here. That's right. Not that you didn't have confidence in the first place, but you you were making progress. Yeah, when the first time it. I got to play against Rosie Greer, my first real game. Yeah. You know, the guy was enormous. <laughs> Get me out of here. Anyway, <laughs> let's was, let's talk about you, you. You got traded to the Eagles. Okay? Yeah. And you played on the Eagles, right. and you had to play Dallas twice a year. That's right. So now. The team that you were practicing against, no. now you're actually playing against. No. You know, and you had, I think, Ed Tutal Jones. Come well, uh, Tutal Jones, well, he was more on, he was on the end, so I didn't right. really block him that often unless it was an end sweep. Right. Uh, I went against Bob Lilly. All game long. Enough said. <laughs> he, 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 uh, he had a way of saying, John, you're good, but I'm better. <laughs> right. Without saying it. Uh, and, you know, I played well against them, don't get me wrong, we, right. we, we played well against each other, uh, we lost the game, I did get the, I did get the, the game ball, believe it or not, <laughs> and I went, well, I guess I earned that one, but no, Lily was just, uh, uh, he made, it made no difference who he was going against, he was going to play as well it's as business. he did, yeah. and he made me look stupid on a few field plays, and uh, unfortunately I, you know, we came out ahead on a few plays, but the point is that, he was that good, you know, right. and I respected that. And he was the only guy who's ever scared me to play against. Right. Not because of the... I knew he wasn't going to beat me up, but he could run around me fast good. and I could run... Yeah, he was right. very good. And so I didn't want to play that badly, and I, I fortunately I played well that year, uh, even though I didn't come back the next year and play again. But I, I just feel that physically, your body could just take so much. Uh, I was healthy back then, my leg was sort of repairing pretty well, I felt that I could play another year or two. Until I went against Bob, I right, thought, maybe right. I better not play that long. Maybe <laughs> but, you know, yeah, but listen, to hear you talk. You know, it's like two players that respect each other. You know, and you guys are, are, are have been in the league for a while, yeah. and you played against each other. It's almost like you know, we're playing against each other now. Now we're we're again now we're opposite teams. But thank you for what you did for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what you did for mm -hmm. me. And you guys went out there and played well. Yeah. You know, yeah, wasn't dirty. What no, you you were doing your jobs. Yeah. Well, those two games, when I played for Philadelphia, uh, 
I, I remember playing pretty well. You know, the coach came up and caught it. They gave me a game ball or something. Right. Offensive line, never get a game ball, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But I was very grateful. In fact, it's here somewhere. I can't remember. Well, anyway, point being is that, that they respected me enough to give me that game ball. At the same time, I did play well that game. But I probably couldn't tell you I play well all the time against Bob Lilly. You just right. don't play all the time great against Bob Lilly. Right, right. And I'm sure he got me a few times too. So right. looking back on it, let's be honest, we're all in the same game. We just want to be able to tell our coaches that, uh, hey, you, you didn't make a mistake putting me in. Right. Right. That's awesome. Ice Bowl. I know a lot of people, you know, that's the coldest game on earth. Probably right. the most memorable game on oh, earth. Oh, yeah. Sure. And that was your... First year, second year? Uh, ice Bowl was my first year. First, first second year, year second, yeah, year, second, second year. year. 67. Yeah, 67. I went at the Ice Bowl. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, we were, yeah, 1967 was the Ice Bowl. It was against the Green Bay Packers, of course, and people remember that game. Should never have been played because we went out there that morning. Uh, well, the day before Saturday, we went out there and we were told that this field is in great shape. That they had uh, they had uh, covered the field the night before or something like that, and they we went out there on Saturday and practiced, and it was a great field. I mean, it was good shape. It was right. nice, it was regular turf. That night, Vince Lombardi watered the grass. It froze that <laughs> night. You never heard about that story? True story. He watered the grass. They turned the sprinklers on, and they watered the ground, and it's freezing cold out now. This is no inside interstate. Wow. And it froze, and there were frozen spots on the field. You couldn't get your, it was like skating on ice. Couldn't get traction. Couldn't get any traction. So what we did, Bob Hayes and I, we took the cleats off our, our shoes, and the spikes were sticking down. The, the uh, screw on. Right, top. right. They act just like racing spikes. Racing spikes, racing spikes were common to Bob Hayes because they wore those in the sprints. Small ones, yeah, like the, yeah. Yeah, well, they had spikes on them. They literally uh -huh. had spikes. Yeah, and that was their, And he loved it, you know. So he put spikes on. I put spikes on, and he had some good runs back that day. But unfortunately, we just ran out of time. Right, <laughs> like it, right, of right. But it was a tough. I mean, back and forth, the, the cold, the chill, the wind. Yeah. You know, having to stay warm. Should never been played. All of us were so frozen. You know, I wore a, 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 a t-shirt under my under my shoulder pads, and that's all I wore. That's all right. I wore all year round. And when the game came around, I didn't even wear the t-shirt. I wanted to feel it. Right. And uh, I, wanted, I also want to get warm. Right. And the only way you get warm in a football game is you start running around and, you know, you f kind of forget about it after a while. Right. But in my case, I was very fortunate that I had spikes in my foot. Bob Hayes had taken his spikes off. We had a good run. The first touchdown or second touchdown, I think, I think it was Bob Hayes receiving a ball or running in or then sweep or whatever. But it turned out that, you know, it did play better for us, uh, but we lost the last Part of the game. Seven, yeah. It's crazy. But that, that that had to be hard on the body. I mean, that cold, you guys are colliding, you're falling, yeah. you're hitting the ground, you're getting back up. Everything about it was cold, and I'm sure that was the longest game. It was. It, was, it should never have been played. I think the fans got cheated. But history didn't. Right, right. History flourished. Uh, the fans got cheated. Right. Including our fans, I think. Yeah, that was you know, probably the longest game of your year, no, your career, and probably a game that you want to forget. Yeah. Most, most, well, probably most Cowboys do, but uh, fans of the sport of football, such as me, love that game. You know, love the game because there's a lot of true grit on, on that on that game. You know, that people played. Yeah. That that game I also remember is the morning of the game. Somebody was banging on my door. I woke us up. And as we get up, we couldn't open the door. We stayed at a Holiday Inn in, in, uh, in uh, wasn't in Green Bay, it was uh, some, some town next to Green Bay, Appleton, Wisconsin. Right. We stayed at Appleton. And it was an old, old, typical Holiday Inn. We were upstairs, downstairs, and you walk up and you walk along the, and you go in your room. And they put us all upstairs because they want us right. quietly as much as <laughs> we can. The next morning, they tried to wake us up, and they knocked on the door. And we couldn't open the door. Frozen shut. It was frozen shut. All the humidity in our in our in our steam or in our room right. had actually frozen the door shut. So the next morning is they had to kick in all the doors to get us out of this room. We were late for breakfast. We were late for a meeting. We were late. This was a ch championship game. Wow. We were late for everything because they had to kick in all the doors to get everybody out of the hotel room. That's you know, right. you're talking 40, 50 doors maybe. Right. That's something that nobody would even think about. No, and in your and that you stay in. And that was the last time we stayed in Appleton, Wisconsin. <laughs>
Now, but it, it, things like that you remember. And things like that disturb you, too, to some degree. You know, you have a routine. Right. Every routine starts with a habit of doing this and doing that. Right. You line them all up, and before you know it, it's... Uh, 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 and, and one of the extreme cases is, is if you remember, they, uh, they had an idea. They said, if you take foil, or, or whatever, foil, it was just simple wrapping foil, mm -hmm. and wrap your feet in it to keep your feet warm. I thought, that's a great idea. So I put, I put foil in my shoes. Did it sure did, but it made your feet sweat. Right. And when your feet sweat, you don't want to sweat in your shoes because you slide around too much. Right. I finally took the foil out. Right. <laughs> but, it's, but it seemed like, like almost like... It works. like cooking, yeah. It worked. I mean, your feet were frozen. Kept, yeah, it kept warm. You get running backs so it gets cold. They were cold, didn't it? We wrapped them in saran wrap. Right. We wrapped it in foil. I don't know why. <laughs> Somebody had a brain idea of... Hey, I'm a, I'm an, I'm a, I'm a carpenter. I know what foil can do. And I, okay, whatever. Wow. So, those are the strange stories you remember, and it's all true. That's very interesting because that's the common sense stories that we, that we would know, would know as, yeah. as a fan. Well, one yeah. player didn't. I, I don't know who it was. I, I, maybe it was Fitzgerald or somebody uh, playing next to me. But somebody didn't put their foil in. They did it at halftime because they knew exactly what they had. They didn't realize how cold it was. Right. And it then, was cold. Twenty below zero. And that was in the sun, under the sun. And I'm sure some of your players, well, even you, I mean, you got fingers that probably don't, that, that, are, that were affected by it, toes, yeah. knees. I mean, uh, just the, the, the chill of the, the cold that... Well, that it also gave away our game plan, too. If you know, I don't know if you remember the story, but Bob Hayes, the world's fastest human, the best offensive end we had in a way is mm -hmm. catching balls for long distances and touchdowns. Bob Hayes had a tendency to go up to the line of scrimmage like this. Now that's okay, right? But you got to pull your hands out for the ball snap, right? So if you want to get ready or get down in your oh, stance, oh, okay. Or if you want, to, but if you're going like this off the line of scrimmage, you're not the prime receiver. <laughs> you aren't getting the ball. You're not getting the ball. <laughs> and it was it was that way, you know. The guy wanted to keep his hands warm. He just kept it in his pants. Right. Well, he did it every play except the one he was going to receive on, and they figured it out the first time they ran it. Bob Hayes took his hands out of his pants down on the ground like normal starting position, and took off. And he was the primary receiver. So if they could shut him down, which they did, because right. they only caught like two or three balls, a couple of good ones, but, he caught, but they were prepared for it. Uh -huh. They saw it in the first quarter. Bob Hayes was giving it away, giving the, giving the right, right. pass away. You know, so sometimes. they keyed on him. They keyed and on it, him. It, I, you know, it probably made a difference. Uh, I, I don't recall what the situation was back then, but it right. probably would have made a difference because they just... They just barely beat us, I think, with 19 to... It was a good hard, hard fight game. Yeah, it was a good game. Right. But it shouldn't have been played. If you really wanted to learn it, if they really wanted a good game, they should have just held off. But right. That's right. football. Right. That's one it's of the greatest history things ever. And tradition. Exactly. We are traditional. <laughs> we guys, I mean, that's a game that uh, Cowboys and, and, and America's team and, and Green Bay Packers, it's, only, it's, it's a game that, that will never be forgotten. You guys will always be remembered. John, let's, let's talk about... I wanted to mention briefly, real quickly, about your accomplishments in, in college. You know what you because everybody's got offensive to get, linemen don't get any compliments in college. Are you kidding? You have achievements. You, I mean, you, you know, you, you get you, you get. You better be a running back or a quarterback. I, you're drafted number one, so you had to accomplish yeah, well, something. Okay. That's all. It's okay, you were all Big Ten in '64 and '65. Mm -hmm. All, all American 1964-65. You were named to Iowa All-Time Football Team in 1989. You're 1997 inducted into the Sofic Sports Hall of Fame. Is that how I would pronounce it right? Mm, Suffolk okay, County is Suffolk County. Thing. Nobody cares about it. Okay. 2006, you were inducted into the University of Iowa Athletics Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's an achievement. I mean, being in college, that's, that's awesome. Well, because right? they, they, they still remember you. You know, and you and you and you and you played so well that, that they that they honored you. So that's got to mean something to you. It does. It really does. I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm very blessed. Very blessed. I was very fortunate to have the success I had. I look back on it, I'm very grateful I was able to play for two different teams, too. Right. To me, that gave me a real perspective, uh, because at that point I became a Christian, and uh, in the process of learning, learning about Christianity, I didn't want to be a, a church Christian, if you know what I'm saying. Right. I right. wanted to be someone that understood, and we played on Sunday, so I couldn't be a church Christian right, on Sunday. Right. So what made us different? Well, after I got saved, Coach Landry brought me to his office. And I apologized to him. I said, you know, what happened last night or the night before was, and I explained it to him because it was 
a fight with the police. Right. Uh, they took me to the hospital. You know, I wasn't locked up, but they were getting ready to. And I went into him and I said, listen, I'm going to tell you what happened last night. Uh, and I went through the whole story. And he's sitting there listening to me and he said, you know, I, I understand, John. Uh, I understand. And, uh, you know, like Paul, uh, Paul's in the New Testament. And I never read the Bible. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Paul's in the New Testament. He was one of the disciples. And, uh, uh, you know, the Lord uh, told him to uh, do something. And, and, and the Lord knocked him off his horse and got his attention, too. And I think that's what he did to you last night. And I went, okay, all right. And what do you suggest I do now? He said, well, you know, you better just... The Lord's talking to you somehow. You better pay attention. Right. Well, that turned me on to Christianity from the standpoint of at least talking to someone who was a Christian. Right. I had just become a Christian the night before through all this stuff that happened. And talks, and he accepted it. He understood it. And it gave me great... If he had not accepted it at that point and, and told me to go change your clothes and get back to practice now, you know, at the end of the conversation, he said, come on, hurry up. You're late for practice. We're going to find you for being late. Right. <laughs> He had discipline everywhere. But the point is that, you know, he understood me, and I said to him, well, listen, I thank you very much, you know, and nothing happened. I wasn't disciplined, nothing happened. I wasn't doing anything wrong, but he understood I got saved the night before because right. he really understood Christ and, and the spiritual life that I was trying to lead, or at least getting into, because right. I had never understood the spirituality at all prior to that. I mean, I was brought up in a church, and I was brought up, and nobody really sat me down and understood all right. that was going on. I'm just very grateful that Landry did understand. He didn't. He didn't uh, convict me in any way. He didn't. Uh, he just simply said, "Go change for practice." I think he's seen the change in your life. What yeah. it was going to do to you, and he can actually see and feel, you know, yeah. the, the the genuine John Island when you when when you talk to him. Yeah, he also got me involved with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which he was involved with at that point. Right. And that to me was like a, a like a training school. You know, I wanted to learn what I did. Right. I wanted to learn what I don't have to deal with anymore. I wanted to learn what I had to deal deal with for the future. And to me, learning became a source of communication between Landry and I. He understood I was just growing spiritually. Uh, and and, and uh, he did not criticize me for that incident that happened. He was more appreciative of the fact I came and told him. Right. And I think that made a difference to our relationship. So at, at that point, we had a different relationship. In fact, I, I asked Coach Landry, would he come to Bible study at my house? And I don't think he's ever been to Bible study. That's I mean, awesome. he had Bible study at, at, at uh, he would do uh, like devotionals on Sunday morning. Right, right. Sometimes he would give us an open book Bible message. But I think I'm the only co the only player that invited him over for dinner that he actually showed up. Wow. And I invited Roger, I invited Craig Morton, I invited a bunch of the players, uh, and a few of them came. But the point being is he came over and was with our family. Now, long story short, it also became issue of foot. When I became a, a believer, I wanted to start Bible study. I wanted to have something I could learn, mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't understand anything about the Bible. I had never understood the Bible. Uh, and so I said, would you mind coming to the first Bible study? And he did. Wow. He came to the first one, and uh, Landry came. Roger was there. Uh, Craig Morton was there. I think Mel Renfro, if I'm not mistaken. I, I believe one or two others. And it turned out, we had about five or six guys come to our first Bible study with the Dallas Cowboys. And I was very interested in seeing that Coach Landry had enough uh, confidence that he came to, and he started us. And that Bible study, I think, is still going on today in some right. ways. I don't know if it's still the same group, but right. uh, obviously it's not the same teachers. But the point is that we had some great teachers come in and teach us about what spirituality was all about, wow. and particularly about Jesus Christ. And what a way to bring you guys together closer yeah, as a did. team, and closer as a, not only as a team, but as, as, as individuals. Yeah. And, as and Roger doesn't like me to say this, but it's true. Roger came to me after, and, and I was born a Catholic, and so was Roger. Roger mm -hmm. brought a Catholic. And Roger came to me after the Bible study, and he said to me, you know, John, I've been a Christian all my life. That's the first time I remember studying and learning about the Bible. Wow. Because as we were growing up, and why I went to, where I went to church, we read the Bible, but we didn't study it. We didn't, right. you know, it was more of a, a, a works religion and a, a legal religion. Mm -hmm. and, and I was grateful I had that spirituality tidbit as a young kid, but right. I never really lived by it, you know. Right. I didn't have any conviction from it. And I had no spirituality growth from that. But after uh, this incident one night, and uh, it was after a game, uh, I did get, a, get in a fight with police. I had all those things happen to me. And I go to practice the next day. He said, get your clothes changed. I understand. Paul from Damascus, get on. <laughs> okay, whatever you say, Coach. Wow.
And that gave me tremendous peace. We went outside together. We ran around the field together that the same day. Right. And uh, it's been the same since. It was the same relationship after that. Uh, it, was, it was a total three-dimensional conviction from my standpoint that he understood that I right. didn't understand yet. Right. You follow me? Yeah. And he kind of, he kind of um, discipled me to some degree. Mentally. And I was very grateful for that too, you know, right. and, and he got me involved in, in, in FCA and got me involved. And these are the things I really enjoyed. You know, the thing about that is, is that Tom Landry, he's a player's coach as well. And, and you know, he's seen you struggling, and he's seen your mistake, but I think what, what, what he respected the most is that you went up to him and you apologized. You know, yeah, and, yeah, and I, I did. I, 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 knew that, I knew to go to coach. Well, you obviously went to coach, obviously, right. when you come back from jail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I was really, we were communicative, and he and he, he talked about the Bible, and he wouldn't push it on the team, although he knew he was a Christian, you know, right, he, right. he'd let it, everybody know. But he was never one to kind of lecture us spiritually, but he was one that would encourage us to be involved, and that's what he did for me, he encouraged me. Right. To be spiritually involved, not right. just team-wise. But what he didn't realize is, uh, is, is the, what he turned you into, because you... You uh, talk a lot about your spiritual. Yeah. You know, when you go to Rotary clubs and, and you and, and meetings and stuff like that, that people ask you to, to speak engagements. Yeah. You speak about your faith. But the thing I, I, I've noticed about you is that you really get into your faith. Your it's heart, it's heart spoken. You know about your well, faith. Well, I, 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 I have to admit, my wife has kept me very uh, grounded and, and found me many good spiritual books that I could read. And at the same time. The fact that she's a believer and we do things together, I'm very grateful that she's supportive of me. She's more supportive of me than anybody else. I mean, that, that to me is amazing. She finds books for me. She's been able to uh, accept my weaknesses, which I do have. Right. Uh, I, I can sometimes be a terrible, uh, I have been sometimes very terrible to my wife and my family, which I beg, beg forgiveness for, and they've forgiven me. Right. What a great witness right there, you know. I right. mean, they, she could have left me years ago. <laughs> But I, I like your, uh, I like your uh, when, when when you do talk about the Lord, you always have some kind of uh, uh, what am I trying to say? You uh, diagram. You you have a story to tell with that. And I mean, if you don't if you don't understand, like for instance, if I don't understand exactly what you're saying, well, you always come back with a diagram or or, or a story, so yeah. to speak, and you tell. You know, well, like it, that, it, you know, for example, if we had just met, and I don't know you, let's say, and you're mm -hmm. not a Christian, let's say you're not a Christian. I know you are right now. But right. I know that you've been a Christian a long time, but let me illustrate this to you. If you were not a Christian and we got into a conversation, you're going to know within a few sentences I'm a believer. I don't right. know how I do it. It's going to come out. Right. And I look at you and I say, and, and you get upset over it, maybe. You're not receptive to it or you're not listening. Right. And I'd look at, turn to you and I'd say, listen, we know each other. We've known each other for a couple of years, but let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. If I was to tell you that many years ago I had an incurable disease, and, and this incurable disease had, a, had, a, had a, uh, a remedy, but the insurance would not pay for it. It was very expensive. And the neighbors, the people that cared about me in my neighborhood, took up a collection and found me that drug, had it sent over, I took it, and I got well. Wow. Now I'm sitting here today telling you that I got well because I was on a deathbed. And the deathbed was um, something I had to face. Anyway, if I told you that story, and if you knew me, you would have sympathy probably to some degree, or at least have a feeling of empathy. Right. Somebody cared enough to go out and, and, and gather up friendships, and they all chipped in and bought me that drug, and that drug has made me well. Right. I'm sitting here today because of that. How would you want me to respond to these people out here that weren't judgmental but cared enough and they were praying for me? And I'm sure people were praying for me back then to get saved. You follow me? I follow you. And I'm telling you the same story that I heard from someone else in the same type of capacity. If you're going to witness to somebody and, and they do not accept it and they want to challenge you on it, tell them a story similar to that. You were sick. I was sick for many, many years, and the salvation I got through Jesus Christ made me well, and I have eternity today because forgiveness of sin allows me to enter the kingdom of God. Right. I don't understand all that. 
you know, it's easy words to put out of your mouth, but I, first of all, in my, time, my life and my heart, at that point, I became very comfortable with my salvation. Right. I understood it for the first time, just like that story I just told you. I was sick for a long time. We're all sick. Right, right. And we have this great drug, if you want to call it that, and it's called salvation. <laughs> Uh, through the death, you know, through the death and burial of Christ, right. that salvation is our drug for eternity, and we're well. I'm well today because would you like to have that same information? Definitely, definitely. You understand? And that opens the door. You right. know, something like that. Because that, to me, I read that story. I can't take credit for that story. I looked that story up, and and when somebody, a friend of mine, who writes very well, wrote that in a book that he had, and I read it, and I thought, wow, I can use that. I can use it. Yeah, I was sick. It's an awesome example. And and the salvation you have, the drug you're getting is, is God's grace. Right. Right. How, you, how do you go about that? What a better uh, what no what a better uh, story. What a better uh, no, London. Yeah, yeah, it it is it is. And, and I don't think anybody would be offended if I witnessed to them that way. And that's really what I'm doing. I, right. I witnessed to them in that using that story because to me that explains John Nyland. Exactly. It explains all of us to some degree, but we're all sick. Exactly. We just don't know it. All right, what an awesome story. That's, that touches my heart. I hope it touches your heart because it's true. It's what John feels. And you can always tell when John, when John tells, speaks by his heart. You can just look at his eyes. Yeah. You look at his heart. It, it, uh, it, well, my wife, Sean, I give her credit for everything. She supports me. She encourages me. Uh, and she's a life coach for me. Right. And, and she's the perfect woman for me. And I'm just very, very grateful that she is... Stuck out with me for 25 years. <laughs> I mean, she's been through so much. Lives are, so much. Lives are great. Uh, okay. She'll tell you it's 27 years, but I. <laughs> we, we do things in 25 year increments. <laughs> I'm going to hang around for another 25 You're years. You're going to outlive her, right? No, I don't think so. But I do think that uh, uh, I've asked the Lord for another 25 years. I don't know why I want 100. I, it, it just stuck in my head. Right. And I don't want to function if I'm not functioning. Right. If I'm functioning at 100, I want to be around, you know, exactly. if, I, if I can't do it, you know, if I've got to be stuck in the house in a chair, in a, in a invalid of some sort, I don't want to do that. Right. But I do want to be able to talk and communicate and be around for the next, so I think the Lord's got something big for me, and I don't know what it is, but I think you're involved somehow. I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking at the moment, because that's, this is a different... I'd be honored, I'd be honored. I'd but I think, yeah, I think it's something that I could use, because people like you encourage me. Uh, not so much by the interview you're doing here, but he encouraged me because you go out of your way to do this, and I and I don't get it. I mean, I really don't get it. I don't know what's the big deal about history of football. I realize that a lot of people love the game. Okay, that's fine, but to still go back and and uh, and the way you bring it up and the way you have worked with it your, with your wife, who by the way has done a great job too. She's awesome. She's, she's got you. Got, she's got you worked out. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm just grateful that we have women in our lives that can really give us a foundation of strength. Right. What a marvelous understanding. To right. they keep us, they keep us solid. Yeah. They keep us solid. Yeah. I want to say one more thing before. There's a few more achievements that that uh, that John Island made, and where I'm going with this is is kind of what, what what who John is today. When uh, his uh, his uh, achievements in uh, in the NFL, six time Pro Bowl, three times All Pro. Is one of the four offensive linemen that in the Dallas Cowboys history that has six Pro Bowls. They actually say they have six Pro Bowls. Twice as many Pro Bowls as uh, Jerry Kramer of the Green Bay Packers. Oh, and Jerry, I played with him, or against him. I played with him too at the, right. at, the, at the Pro Bowl. But I went up to Jerry and I said, Jerry, congratulations on a great career you have. And I was very, I watched him play. He taught me a lot by mm -hmm. watching him full form. I don't want to get off a sidebar. Okay. Jerry, Jerry, and I went up to Jerry at a banquet we had in Green Bay, where we both made the All Pro team or whatever, and uh, uh, I cried almost. Just it was an honor reading and meeting him. Right. I, I'd learned about him so much there. When I was a high school guy, I hear the name Jerry Kramer, Green Bay Packers, of course. Then you go to college, you still hear about him. And I was just saying that, that was one of my idols. Right. He was a good guy. He was a good role model. Jerry was a good role model. He never had gotten. Never really not get in trouble, or he's played a good game, and yeah. he was good at what he does. Everything he said was always heartfelt. I mean, he was always genuine. And we played the Pro Bowl together. I thought was we played tandem guards at that point. What an experience! Yeah. Right, that's awesome. Played your idol. Yeah, you you appeared in two Super Bowls. You win over the Miami Dolphins, which is a highlight. 
Okay, the offensive lineman, fumble recoveries. I was good. No, you, you got a magnet. <laughs> you had five fumble recoveries and one for a touchdown. Yeah. You were in the history books for a yeah. touchdown for yeah, a lineman. Believe it or not. That's well, I was just I was pretty fast, as I said. I could usually recover fumbles if I was paying attention. Right. I could get there faster than anybody else. But that was just basically a, a natural reaction all of us had. So I didn't really specialize in it, Thanks but I was ball. unfortunately didn't drop the ball. That's awesome. Let's go some of some of your uh, uh you're uh, number the 50 greatest Dallas Cowboy players by ESPN. You're number 30. Yeah, that was quite an honor. I thought just just to just to be you know selected as one of the best players of all time, uh, and, you know, and that's just a nice honor, quite right. frankly. But there's a lot of good players on the team. That's playing consistently, I mean, always yeah. consistently being a great great player. In 2017, you were inducted to Gridiron Greats Hall of Fame. Oh, that was a nice a nice honor too. I, the Gridiron Greats are a little bit laid back on the sense that you only read about them and hear about them very much, but it was also started by Mike Ditka, right. who was my teammate and my coach for a long time. Right. Uh, I just really uh, respected Mike, and when he called me and said they voted me in, I was very blessed. That's very awesome. Nice. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great award. Mike Ditka, he's a player's. I mean, he's a player. player's player. Player's player. He understands what you're going through. Yeah. He understands it. And, and, I mean, it means a lot to him. I mean, it's not to say, well, let's just throw John Allen in. No, it means something to my Ditka to yeah. have John Allen being put into the Grand Grace Hall of Fame. You know, so, I mean, it's, that also says a lot about John. Okay, and you also, you play against 30 Hall of Famers oh, in really? your playing career. Like you play against a Ring of Honor 51 players. Wow. In, in your playing career. You played against... The you best. play against the best. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you, like I said earlier, if you play against the best, you're going to be the best. So that's yeah. a stat a lot of people doesn't, don't realize and don't see you yeah. know, at this. But, I mean, you played against a lot of great players. There's players that you play against that aren't in the Hall of Fame. You know, that, you know, that made you great as well. Sure. You know, and you made them great as well. Well, I voted so, them in as much as I could. Because, I, you know, at the Pro Bowl, we were asked to be voting against players. You know, right. And that, that made my excitement to the game. Right. You know, I get a chance to vote against the players that really impress me. Yeah, I think that's what you're trying to do. Exactly. I want to ask John Island uh, a question that I think is very important. Um, I know it's going to be hard for you to answer this because you're not a selfish player. You don't think about John Island. You're you're a type of person that you think about other people. You know, the other like teammates <laughs> and other other people around. But what would it, what would it mean to you if you were inducted into the Cowboys Dallas Cowboys Ring of Honor and the uh, Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I think mostly it would give me a great opportunity to witness for our Lord Jesus Christ, and I keep going back to that because what else is there? Right. Really, there's nothing else that's that important. Everything has all been done already. We're all going through this reminiscence of history, and we think we're revolving to more excitement and more things and things on top of that. It's hogwash. Um, to, to me, it's all about Christ, and, and to me, it's all about Him giving me life, and what life He's given me is wonderful. You know, challenging and wonderful, it's rewarding, and I want to be able to live it to the fullest. And if I can get out there in front of people and tell them this, right. uh, I don't want to be a Moses or, 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 or someone who communicates uh, poorly. I want to be able to verbalize and share what my faith is. And, and to me, this gives me the great opportunity. Uh, I gave the NFL all my ability. You know, it gave my physical strength. I can't. Well, I can walk and talk, but I can't run to that door over there. Right. I can't. I can't do anything physical. I mean, I can't lift up. I can't touch the back of my head. It's paying a toll on your body. It is. Your body. You give up your whole body. You play this game. You love the game. Your great uh, success we had with the game. Could you imagine the guys that didn't win? We won. You know, right. we won right. for ten years in a row in the playoffs. That's unheard of today. Fifteen playoff games. Yeah, Fifteen years. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know, we were making twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year. They're making two or $3 million a year today. Right. And they don't appreciate what we did for them. They don't understand. Right. The union uh, and the retired players, we don't get much money in retirement. But the players today don't need it. Right. <laughs> they right. got so much money. Right. And, and do they earn it? Sure, they've earned it. It's our society today. But to me, it's all about Christ, and it's all about witnessing for the Lord. And if this gives me a, 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 an altar of some sort to talk, I'm all for it. Right. That's what I would love to do. That's awesome. Great answer. Great that's all answer. I need to do. The only uh, other replayer uh, that's been inducted Hall of Fame is Rachel Wright from your era. There's a lot of great players yeah. on that Cowboy team yeah. that are worthy of the induction. But so. I'm pointing you out because you you you've sacrificed your body. You're a team a team leader. You uh, grew. You brought your team together. You're always a a uh, motivator. 
And you always played hard. You led by, by example. And the thing that I'm impressed about John Allen is that through all the accolades that, 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 that he's done through college football and pro football, I mean, he's noticed as, as a great offensive uh, pulling guard, one of the best in, in the NFL ever. He started, uh, started groups of, uh, of uh, Bible study with his teams. And so through all the accolades and all the Pro Bowls and all the, all the uh, achievements that he's, that he's done, John's not really concerned about that. John's concerned about your faith, about your well-being, about you accepting Jesus Christ. And the thing that I like to do, I'm going to call you... I'm going to call you God's guard. I'm going to call you God's guard because John is still playing guard. Don't give me a title. I won't John is still playing guard because even though he's not on the football field, he's using a platform where, where, where he excelled at, where people remember him at, but he's going to reach souls. He's going to reach hearts. He's going to reach, reach other people that, that, that he's going to mentor that are going to say, you know what? Wow, look what John's brought back out of this game. And look what John's continually doing out of this game. You know, it's a platform, the NFL, yes. But John is a guard for you. He's John's, he doesn't want the devil anywhere around in your body, in your soul, in your heart. John is going to keep preaching. And John's going to save your soul and he's going to bring you salvation to you know, Jesus Christ. When I sit and talk to you, John, I'm ready to run. I'm ready to get motivated. I'm ready to get going. I mean, there's not many people that, that, that get in my heart and pull this out of me. But John has a way of getting with people and wanting their, 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 their salvation. And I can't thank you enough for what you can do and what, what, no, what the NFL has done, what you're doing now, and what you're going to be doing in the future. Well, I think in the future, like I said a moment ago, I'm going to have some kind of spiritual position. I'm, I'm not sure what it is. I don't think I'm a teacher. I, I think I can motivate. I think I can get people's attention. Um, yeah, I like to speak to high school groups, mm -hmm. uh, especially because they're kind of the level I like to communicate with. Uh, but as far as being broken, uh, yeah. yeah, the Lord has made me well again. Right. I was a busted vessel at one time, and He's made me well, and I'm going to try to carry the water as long as I can and try to bring people to an understanding of the salvation message. And if the words coming out of my mouth, if some way you're using the, uh, to uh, witness to somebody, then so be it. That's what I want. I mean, that's all I care about today. Right. That's all I think about. The reason I get up to go to work, my job. I go out right now, I work in the concrete industry. I go out and take people to customers to lunch, and eventually Jesus Christ comes out of my out of my mouth, and either they get up and walk away, or they sit and listen. Even if you get up and walk away, you know what? You planted a seed. That's right. You know, and they're going to think about it. They may not know how to uh, deal with it at that time. That's right. That's right. They don't understand it. They don't understand it. Hey, it took me 35 years to come to my senses. Right. I mean, I just, I'm not proud of it, but it, did, it took me a long time. But it, it, it'll get there. It'll yeah. get there. And you don't realize how many lives that you're going to save um, in your lifetime. You know, you know, you're talking about you know, the next 25 years, uh, you know, ministering to, to people. That's what you want to do. You know, and that's, and, and, and but the thing about it is football and, and, and ministry, football has taught you how to excel, give 100%, yeah. give your heart and soul to the game. You're giving your heart and soul to God. You're giving your heart and soul to, to people that, that need to be saved, yeah. that need to hear this. Well, I've been fortunate to be invited to speak at a lot of t different functions, so I do work with FCA, I do work with uh, uh, different groups around the community, uh, you know, so if they need me for something, call me. I'm more than happy, don't put the number up. <laughs> now, now, John, John said what I was going to ask. If you guys have any, uh, any uh, you know, interviews you want him to speak at, any engagements, mm -hmm. any Rotary Clubs, any high schools, or any uh, uh, businesses? Be my agent. Be my agent. <laughs> you can contact. Uh, I'll let your wife be my agent. I'll let my wife be my agent. <laughs> you can contact me on Facebook, Chapman Sports Collectible LLC. Give me your information. Give me what you're uh, interested in in John, and I can pass it on to John. Okay. And uh, I tell you, uh, watch some of his interviews that uh, that he's spoken to Rotary Clubs, or just just talk to John. He's very uh, very good at what he does, but I'm sure they're very good at what he does. Is he cares. He's genuine. And and if you don't know the Lord, after you talk to John, you're going to know the Lord. Hmm. I, I promise you that. And you're going to want to excel in this. You're going to want to pass it on. Because the feeling you get in your heart and in your mind and soul, having Jesus Christ in your heart, in your everyday life, it just can't be, can't be, uh, it's hard to say what it is, but your life is totally different for the best, for the, for the, for the greatest. And John, man, hmm. thank you so much. I appreciate you so much. I'll end by telling you one interesting story. I've had people invite me to speak, and the first question I ask them in, in rebuttal or, or cover, 
can I mention Jesus Christ? And if they say no, I say, no, I'm not coming. <laughs> I'm not coming. There's that, that important to you. It's important. Yeah, that's important. Awesome. Hope you all enjoyed the interview. Thank you so much. God bless. so much for watching today's video. If you would like John Nyland to speak at your next sports engagement, send a message to Chapman Sports LLC by going to Facebook.com and looking up Chapman Sports Collectibles LLC. I look forward to hearing from you.